Today, we're going to be talking about fear. And Jesus, one of the most common commands that he gave, one of the things that recurred the most was don't be afraid. Now, when I say that right off the bat, there are many of you in here who feel like it's impossible to not be afraid. And there are a few reasons for that. About 25% of the population um, suffer from some kind of an anxiety disorder. And it is biological. Um, it's um, pathological. I don't know if that's the right word. It's just inside us. How about that? Like diabetes or heart condition, something that many times we have to get medication to offset and counseling or therapy. And when I say don't be afraid, you can still be anxious and you can still struggle with anxiety, but yet choose not to fear. So don't discount this message if you might fall into that category. For the rest of you, there's something today that you're going to hear that I think is going to be encouraging to you, and I hope life-changing to you. Now, I'm just going to tell you the principle right off the bat. The principle is this. Jesus says, don't fear. You do not have to be afraid even when there's something to be afraid of. And he reminded the disciples of this over and over again. The disciples in turn taught both Jews and Gentiles. The Gentiles, particularly as the faith, the Christian faith grew, it took root and they began to share it with others. And it affected every single generation from their time all the way until ours, should we choose to apply it. Now, I have struggled with this. Maybe you do too. I feel like that for me, being afraid is being responsible. And I can help God by making sure that I flip every angle, that I look at every you know, sort of nuance, that I can figure out every scenario. Or, or, uh, and once I've done my work of obsessing over things and being you know, duly afraid, then he in fact can take con uh, charge or take control and bring about his outcome. I don't know if any of you relate to that. Maybe some of you just can mindlessly go through life never thinking about the consequences. Sometimes I wish I was that person, but I'm not. I fall more toward that 20 25%. But this is a message today that's for everybody. And Jesus gives this to us so that we can live differently and understand what this life is supposed to be about. So I'm going to take you all the way back to the life of Christ as he's teaching his disciples who in turn take their lessons and begin to teach them to both Jew and Gentile alike, Gentiles being non-Jews. And with the Gentile world or society, the non-Jews, most of us in here, um, we have become the church and the church still practices these things although some practice them more effectively than others do. So let's look back in Matthew, at Matthew chapter eight. Many things, important things happen on a boat. And in this particular situation, Jesus was on a boat with his disciples. Now, he got into the lake and his disciples followed him. And suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Now, some of you have had storms in your life that are real storms, some of you are going through things right now in your life that are real, that are overwhelming, that are, they're scary. And there's something to be afraid of. And some of you, or maybe somebody you know, has turned to Jesus and called out for help. And he appears to be sleeping. And maybe somebody you know, or maybe you have been tempted to leave your faith because of it. And although I understand why somebody might do that. I think the logic is flawed or faulty because we're upset because God doesn't do what we ask him to do when we ask him to do it. And we tell him that his will is not as important as mine. So the disciples were afraid and there was something to be afraid of. And they looked to Jesus and they said, Jesus, help us. And they saw Jesus asleep. Now, Jesus woke up. After the disciples called out to him and said they were going to drown, Jesus got up and he said, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? And maybe that phrase would connect with you on a deep level today. Maybe you have things in your life that are medical, financial, emotional, relational, and you feel like you're in a boat in the middle of a storm and the waves are beginning to crash over the sides. And you look at Jesus and you wonder, are you awake? Are you paying attention? And Jesus got up and he said, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and they said, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. First, they were afraid of the storm and then they were afraid of Jesus. Now, Jesus goes on in Matthew chapter 10 and reinforces this point. 
he talks about sparrows. And he says to the disciples, because by this time the disciples might've thought they were invincible, that nothing bad could happen to them. And in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is reinforcing this as he repeats it so many times. And he says, listen, you don't have to be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy the body and the soul in hell. And he says, remember the sparrows, those cheap little birds. And I can relate to the sparrows, maybe not worth a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. He says two for a penny, basically. Not one falls without the father paying attention. And then Jesus goes on and he says, and even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many, many sparrows. But here's the problem. The problem is, and I can find the problem in any good news. The problem is that sparrows fall. And when sparrows fall, it's scary because we don't want anything bad to happen to us. Did your mama ever tell you that there's nothing to be afraid of? There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be afraid of. Mama's wrong. There's lots of stuff in life to be afraid of. The monster might not be in your closet, but yet there are probably monsters. The boogeyman that may not be under your bed, but yet, unfortunately, somebody's bed somewhere. Maybe the boogeyman's there. I don't know. People get sick. They die. People become alone. They get broke. Things happen. And that hedge of protection that so many so faithfully pray over their own lives when it doesn't go the way we want, it causes us to question faith and sometimes assume Jesus is sleeping and then perhaps walk away. So Jesus says, don't be afraid, but yet life is scary. So what do we do about it? We don't have to be afraid even when there's something to be afraid of if we choose to focus on Christ. Cognitive psychology has two main principles and I never would take psychology and interpret the Bible that way, but I would take the Bible and learn a little bit about the way we think and the way we are. And these two principles are very consistent in cognitive psychology. They talk about two things. One is that we become what we think about. The things that we entertain in our minds, the things that we ruminate over, the things we repeat, that we become what we think about. The apostle Paul says that we have to put the things in our mind that are right, that are pure, that are good, that are holy, that'll bring about righteousness. Yet so many times we find ourselves worrying or obsessing over things that aren't helpful whatsoever. The second principle is that we can't just make sure that we're thinking about the right kinds of things, but we have to make sure that we're putting the right kinds of things in our brains intentionally, which means that we keep some of the things that we're allowing to come into our brains out of our brains intentionally because it's a battle for focus. We can focus on the storm or we can focus on Jesus who has the power to calm the storm. And even if he doesn't, no one has to fear if we believe in a risen savior because our risen savior has defeated sin, Satan and death leaving no cause for fear so that anyone who believes in him is guaranteed the life to come. But man, is it hard. Anybody ever test that you can't study for? Um, have to take a test? Sure you have. Anybody been to the doctor? So I took a test on Monday that I can't study for. I had to go in and get an ultrasound and they're gonna wait and tell me, you know, whether my lymph nodes are good or not from my papillary thyroid cancer. I don't have any bad news. The problem is I don't have any news at all because doctors, and I love them, they take their time. You know, I should be the only patient in the world. I'm not number whatever, I'm number one, right? Call me back. I'm, this afternoon's plenty of time. And so on Monday, I got my, my ultrasound and I'm laying there and I'm like, man, you know, this cancer is something that probably ain't gonna kill me. They said, maybe I'll die with it, but not from it. But, you know, treatment and stuff may happen if, I, um, if I'm going the wrong way. And so I'm laying there on the table and I'm thinking, here I am taking another test I can't study for. I don't like failing anything. I can't train for it. I can't read anything. You know, it's, it's just one of those things. And so the guy gets done and I said, okay, what's gonna happen? He goes, well, we're gonna send this to our radiology here and 
Des Moines and then they'll send it to radiology in Iowa City and then that radiologist will send it to your doctor and your doctor will probably send it to his assistant and then they'll call, which sounds like a really streamlined and efficient process, doesn't it? And I told you I'm one of the 25%. I'm prone toward anxiety and I'm prone toward fear. Now I know if I die, I'm going straight to heaven and I'm not worried about that. It's just the process that I'm not real excited about. And so on Monday, I'm doing great, focusing on the reality of heaven. Jesus calms the storms and if he doesn't, it's just fine. On Tuesday, I'm like, oh my goodness, I haven't heard back from them, what's going on? On Wednesday, I start to obsess a little bit and think, well, maybe I need to help God in this. Maybe I need to worry a little bit. Maybe I need to, what if my case is so complicated the doctors can't figure it out? What if they're consulting each other? On Thursday, I'm sure they've sent my records to Mayo and they're gonna end up using me as a, a test case, a study dummy. And on Friday, I'm like, I've got to, I have to stop this. For goodness sake, I'm preaching, I'm teaching my friends about fear on on Sunday and here I am. And I wish I could tell you what the results were, but I still don't know. I called on Friday, I left a message. I'm like, hey, it's me, Rick, again. Um, have you lost my records? Uh, hello? Some of us wanna know. Who doesn't know that feeling? And that feeling can be transposed into anything. Financial obstacles that seem impossible to overcome relationships that are falling apart, emotional issues, family issues, decisions that we have to make in life and with jobs. And we look at Jesus and we say, Jesus, are you asleep? Are you paying attention? What's going on? Hey, it's me, Rick. It's me, Dan. We need answers. And sometimes he does and sometimes he makes us wait. But we don't have to be afraid even though there are things to be afraid of if we believe in a risen savior. The question is how much do you believe that there's a risen savior? Because this choice will define the rest of your life. And whether or not we take Jesus at his word and accept his promise will determine your mental and emotional state on your journey because fear is an emotional response to something that we think can be dangerous, deadly, intimidating, life-changing. And sometimes this kind of stuff happens. Now we're gonna come back in a minute and we're gonna apply this and I hope make some sense out of it. But before then we're gonna sing. And I wanna invite you to participate in the singing but I also want to invite you to participate in the praying. I'm gonna have some friends here in the front and um, we're just gonna be here for you if you wanna pray about anything. So my wife and I, Joy, we were on a walk. Um, I think it was Monday. And uh, Joy knows you know, what I'm teaching ahead of time, just like I do. And when we walk, I, oftentimes I do, um, I do my cardio at the same time I study. So I'll listen to sermons other pastors preach or I'll listen to some chapters of books or podcasts on things that I'm gonna share with you and just sort of prime the pump. And so Joy and I were out walking and as we were out walking, oftentimes I'll make her, or I don't make her, I just you know, hand her one of my earpieces, you know, my little earbuds and she puts it in her ear and she listens along with me and we talk and, and whatever about what we're listening to. And we just got done with the message on, on uh, focus and on fear and setting your mind on truth and things like that. And we're around in the corner in the mean streets or on the mean streets of Prairie Trail neighborhood. And um, we hit the, the rabid goose section that I've shared with you before. Rabid geese, I don't know where they come from. It's the mean part of Canada, but um, these geese are just something else. And I have the anecdote, I've told you before, it's the Capel's trick of clapping. These geese, they do not like clapping. The golf course geese don't care. These geese, they don't like clapping at all. And so I know I'm armed with the tools to be able to, to make the geese turn the other direction. Uh, and I don't even know why their geese left because most of the smart geese have already gone south like some of our church, right? For the, for the winter, the weather's getting cold. And so we go to warmer places, but these were like the 12 or 14 geese that are trying to book vacation late in the year so they have the whole place to themselves and they're hanging out on the concrete walking path or the trail and when they hang out well you know what geese do um, I don't know what else they do but I know you step in a lot of what they do which is kind of where I'm going to with my story now I hear 
a woman on the phone. I'm not being gender biased. This just happens to be a woman. Um, and she was loud. I heard her before I saw her. Okay. And, um, sometimes people don't know or don't think about the fact that there's actual amplification technology in the phone. And when you talk into it, you don't have to scream because the person can hear you, even though you're, you know, so she was talking loud enough for her mom to hear her in Florida. And so I heard her before I saw her, she has it on speaker, but the phone's held right up in front of her face. And, and so finally, when I, we get close enough to see what's going on, she's walking, you know, and she's got the phone and she's yelling into her mama and um, she's dragging this dog named Fred. And Fred was doing his own thing. And now the lady wasn't paying any attention. She was in the conversation. She was focused. She was engaged. And, and as she was walking toward me and I'm observing, I love to observe people. They probably observe me and think I'm just as weird, but people are weird. Do you know it? We're strange. We do strange things. She's dragging this dog, Fred. And every once in a while, she'll be like, come on, Fred. But she doesn't know what Fred's doing. Come on, Fred. And she'll jerk the leash. She has no idea what Fred's doing. Fred's this um, overweight beagle mix who looks like he doesn't want to be out there in the first place. And Fred was dragging behind. But Fred, and the lady didn't know because she's focused talking on the phone. Fred was dragging his face in the goose poop as dogs will do. So Fred's on one side, he's got his face and he's like dragging it on the, on the grass. And then the lady will jerk his leash behind, not looking back. Come on, Fred. He goes to the other side and drags his face. And I mean, his face was racing striped with goose poop and the lady has no clue. Now here is the point of this story. The lady talking to her mother was focused. Even though there was an issue she was gonna have to deal with even though there was something that would catch up at the end of the day, but she was focused and the consequences of what she would have to deal with didn't affect her journey at all because she didn't care. She didn't know she was engaged in what she was doing. Jesus took his disciples back to the lake right after he did a huge miracle of feeding many, many people. We've talked about it for many weeks, pushes them out into the water, and he goes back to the hills to pray. A storm came. The storm, the disciples are like, ah, oh, deja vu, here we go. Jesus is ditching and here we are for our lives scrounging, rowing, getting ready to swim. And um, where's Jesus? Where's God? He sent us out here. They were afraid as you and I would be. So they look back and they see what they think is a ghost because it might look like Jesus, but the Jews believe that when a person died, that their spirit hovered above the body for about three days and then went on to heaven. And so they thought maybe it was Jesus. And, and um, Peter stands up and he says, Jesus, Lord, if it's you in the middle of this raging windstorm, tell me to come to you. I don't know why he did it. Maybe he was just wanting to get out of the boat. Maybe he was so excited to see Jesus, he couldn't stand sitting in the boat one minute longer. Maybe he just wanted to do something cool. I don't know. But Jesus said, hey, if you're feeling froggy, jump. Uh, that's, that's not in the Bible. That's my interpretation. Jesus says, come to me then, Peter. So Peter hikes up his man skirt, steps over the side of the boat and starts to walk on water. And it's a miracle. He's focused on Jesus, the person who controls the wind and the waves. Then he began to focus on the storm. And as he focused on the storm, he began to sink. Now, as he began to sink, he called out, Jesus, help me. Jesus reached out his hand and helped him. And he looked at him and he said, ye have little faith, why do you doubt? He didn't say there was nothing to be afraid of, what's your problem? He didn't say, fail, 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 you haven't learned. He said, what's wrong with your faith? why don't you have enough faith in me not to be afraid? You can choose your way, focusing on every obstacle and every issue and obsess over every detail, or you can focus on my way and you can be free. And so Jesus calmed the wind and the disciples were amazed and said, truly you are the son of God. Now Jesus told his disciples how they were gonna die they didn't like it and they couldn't even imagine it until one day Jesus died and he rose again and he defeated sin, Satan and death once and for all. 
and the Holy Spirit was sent after Jesus ascended into heaven and indwelled the life of believers and empowered believers to where the disciples were no longer described as being afraid, boldness and fearlessness was how they were described. And it was passed on from one generation to the next, to the next. Here's some history. Anybody want some history? Okay, if you don't want history, don't say no, because it demoralizes me. In the second century, Marcus Aurelius was the emperor and um, he was in charge of the fourth persecution of Christians. We talked about uh, Christian martyrs last week and he was in charge of the fourth persecution about 180 AD. You may not really resonate or track with 180 AD, but how many of you have seen the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe? Anybody? Okay. First service, people were like, I think that might be a naughty movie. I'm not raising my hand. I don't usually remember stuff in movies. I'm not telling you to watch Gladiator. So do not say, Pastor Rick said, watch Gladiator. I don't remember if there was anything objectionable in there, but I do remember Russell, remember Russell Crowe. And I do remember the culture and society portrayed. So if you can picture that, you can picture what 180 AD looked like. There was a doctor named Claudius Galus. Doctors weren't allowed to examine dead bodies. It was illegal in Roman society but they could examine bodies that were almost dead. And so they did. And Christians were being martyred by the hundreds in terrible ways. And their kids in here, so I will not describe the ways, but they were bad. So this doctor would go and he would examine bodies as these people were about ready to die. And as any scientist would do, he writes his findings. He's documenting his, fi his findings. And he's of course talking to and interviewing as well as looking at the wounds and condition of people before they go to the hereafter. And what he wrote is about Christians. In the case of fearlessness of death, I said fearlessness of death and the hereafter, I see it in these Christians every single day. Because in a Christian's life, the Holy Spirit comes in and empowers them to focus on the fact that we serve a risen savior, that he's conquered death, and that even though there may be things to fear, we don't have to be afraid. Now here, friends, is a diverging trail, a path you have to choose. And it's one of the hardest paths, decisions you'll have to make because it means in a sense that you're giving up control. Now, you and I don't have any control anyway, but I like to think I do. And as I've mentioned to you before, I feel like it's my responsibility to help God out by making sure I've covered all the angles and let him know all the possible things that could go wrong. But it turns out he doesn't need my help. It turns out that I can cast my cares on him and I can let him do the caring for me. It turns out that fear can be replaced with boldness and courage, which were the two words that describe the disciples as they lived their lives up until, in almost every case, terrible deaths that they knew were coming. Fearlessness. But if I choose fear and you choose fear, first of all, it robs us, me and you, of our joy. Secondly, it separates us from the people closest to us and the relationships we're supposed to invest in. And finally, it keeps us from being able to accomplish God's purpose in our life. And you'll end up in the same place at the end of the day if you're a follower of Christ. But instead of enjoying the journey, all you experience is what being truly miserable, what it's all about. And so Jesus says, I can't force you, but I can offer it to you. So do you choose faith and focus and freedom, or do you choose fear? Because mama was wrong. There are things to be afraid of. There is stuff out there that's both scary and dangerous, but we serve a risen savior who has defeated sin, defeated death, defeated Satan once and for all, and in turn has conquered fear. Why wouldn't we wanna be Christians? Why wouldn't we wanna live this kind of life? 
Well, we're just getting started with these in commandments, these don'ts, these nots. Thou shalt not fear. Don't be afraid. You got to come back next week because we're diving right in and we're going to be talking about don't sin. Don't sin. Well, I'm not going to give anything away, but you're going to like next week even more than you did this week. Let me pray for you that we can apply these things to our lives. Father, I know this is a, a task of focus. It's an intentional choice that we make. What do we wrap our minds around? So many of us find ourselves thinking thoughts that are just so unhelpful, so far from things you're concerned about, that we repeat them, sometimes even obsess over them. And we know because we've experienced what we think is really what we believe. Sometimes we're so lackadaisical in what we put into our brains, what we feed our minds and our hearts. So much trash thinking that we'll be unaffected by it. Ignoring the promises in scripture and the truths of your, of your word that originate with the life, the person of Jesus Christ. I pray that we would be people who choose to focus on you, not the storms. You're in control of the storms. You care about us as we are like the sparrows on the days that we fly and on the day ultimately when we fall. You count the, the hair on our head and you care and are concerned. You're involved in our lives, bringing about your will and your plan. And I pray, Father, that we would trust you because we love you and we love you because you loved us first and you proved it by doing all of this through Christ and Christ alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.